Originally, the title of this talk was Vault and the Super Secret Technology, um, which if you read the description of the talk, it makes a lot of sense, right? Um, someone in marketing changed it <laughs> somewhere along the way. Uh, so if you came here for security and fundamentals that scale with Vault, I'm really sorry, but the actual talk is Vault and Sentinel. OK, let's have some real talk here. Um, I am so excited about this, so, so, so excited. Uh, when I first saw Sentinel um, like actually running about, I think it was about early May, um, I immediately just rushed and like, did like a proof of concept, getting it integrated into Vault. Um, and it was so nice. Um, I've been wanting to have this kind of flexibility for so long in Vault. And ever since I did that, I've just been waiting for four months. I've been like, you know, telling people, like, yeah, things are coming. Yes, th this is better. This will be better soon. Things are coming. And sort of like pushing people off. Um, I can keep a secret. That's why I work on Vault. Um, but it's been really hard to hold on to this for such a long time. So why am I so excited about this? It's because of Vault to Ackle. So let's get Ackle imated with the Vault to Ackle system. OK, so Vault Ackles are default deny. Um, they give you privileges in the form of capabilities. So they're very cruddy, mostly. Um, there's create, read, update, delete, list, sudo, and explicit deny, and some other optional restrictions. Um, and they're written in JSON compatible HCL. Uh, basically, there's a path, maps to capabilities that you assign it. That's a very, very basic example. You want secret foo, capabilities create read lists. So whoever is there can create, can read, can list uh, that stuff. Um, and these are merged. So looking at these two path statements, the overall capability grant is create, read, update, delete, and list. Sorry about that. I've been, um, I've been talking for about three days, and I did a full day training, and my voice is pretty shot at this point. So I apologize. I'll be sipping water. Um, so we're going to come back to the fact that they merged, because this is um, something that actually ends up being pretty difficult. So the current policy model is pretty simple. You have one or more ACL path statements. They're placed into a policy. You take one or more policies, you attach them to a token. Um, or identity info, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. And at request time, the policies are combined. So we take the policies as they exist at request time um, in their current state. We don't do any pre-done uh, evaluation. We look at it at that point. And we combine it into this ACL object, which is used to check access. Here's the problem. The larger the installation of Vault, the more likely that some characteristics of ACLs become like serious pain points. So one is HCL and JSON is the language. Um, and I'll go into more detail on these. Next is the path-based workflow. And third is merging. So ACLs are HCL. HCL is JSON compatible. You can use either the HCL syntax or JSON. Both are acceptable. JSON is really simple. It's really compatible, which is one of the really nice things about it. I really love JSON. Um, but it's really a data interchange and configuration language. Um, and it's not very expressive, right? So you can't, th there are plenty of times, probably if you've worked a lot with JSON, where you're saying, I really want to do this kind of complex thing. Now I have to figure out, like, what is the right set of, like, arrays, maps, and other things to kind of shoehorn it into what JSON does. Um, and you can't do introspection. I mean, you, you, you can do this with, like, a lot of code outside of it, but there's nothing native to do introspection, interpolation, logic, et cetera. Um, and there is HashCorp interp uh, interpolation language, which is in Terraform. Um, that came along much later. Um, it's also, compared to Sentinel, quite limited. So, um, so we've added more things, a more. We've added more into ACLs. Um, so you know, over time, we added things like allowed parameters to deny parameters, which themselves are kind of limited, again, because of uh, w what we can do within this JSON scope. Um, so they're not as flexible as they could be. So it's sort of, we've sort of kind of extended the ACL uh, capabilities over time, but they're not, they're not as good as we would like. Uh, they're, sort of, they're specified as grants and restrictions on paths. So um, originally, Vault, you know, uh, if you listened to the keynote yesterday, then they said that it was really kind of scratching an internal itch. We needed a way to store things securely inside HashiCorp. Um, and that was layered on top of console. And so the actual um, the generic or kind of KV secret that, that you get if you start like a dev server, you start a Vault server for the first time, um, the actual code is in a file called logical pass-through. It's called pass-through because it literally is just passing through what you give it straight into console, but in encrypted form. And so the origin of, of, of kind of the path-based workflow, which is really nice in a lot of ways because it lets you organize things you know, via like these HTTP paths, and that actually has a lot of benefits, but um, it was this encrypted KV pass-through. Uh, so it's not an unreasonable choice for protecting APIs because APIs are defined by paths as, long as, as well as like the request objects and the headers and things that you give to it, which can modify behavior. So it's worked pretty well overall. Um, and if you've used the vault and thought, man, a lot of this API is just super weird, a lot of it comes down to the ACL system. We want to be able to say, if this is something that people are probably going to want to restrict, um, then it, they need to be able to write an ACL for it, which means they need to be able to uh, 
to identify that as like a, a path or a prefix of note. So here's the thing. Um, path is a single component of request, right? There's lots of, some, there's more things. There's IP addresses, there's headers, there's uh, request bodies. Um, there's, you know, even things like when did it come in, right? What time is it? All sorts of things about a request that we can't really do anything with um, if you're just looking at a path. So basically, the only way you can deal with this right now in Vault is you can say, I'm going to have a path of star. Um, and you apply that to every single token that you have. Um, but every time that you want to do something that isn't just looking at a specific path, you have to use a path of star. And that just adds up to like lots and lots of, of stuff. Um, so in theory, ACLs are composable because paths are merged. So I mentioned before, I showed that example of, of the two statements. And the total set of capabilities was create, read, update, uh, delete, and list, because the paths are merged together. Um, but what we found is that the more kinds of things we want to put into ACLs, the harder it is to have the correct merge logic. Um, there's potential for conflicts. Like, what do we do if this policy says that this is allowed, and that one is set that that uh, says that it's not allowed, and of course we you know, default to not allowed. Um, but it's, it's, it becomes much more complicated. And when you, have, when you want to have like, arbitrarily complex structures in JSON in ACLs, um, that becomes really difficult. And we found this out when we were doing allowed parameters and denied parameters, where we can support some things, but other things are kind of, uh, you know, we, we don't support maps, right? But there are some things involved that will take in a map as, a, as request data. So we do have some enhancement ideas for ACLs. Um, and we sort of brainstormed over time. Um, but these properties continue to make these enhancements difficult. You know, any enhancement that we make, we have to know how it's going to merge together. Um, we have to come up with, like, what does the syntax look like? How do you express it? And so it's much more difficult to do what we want. All right. And then along comes Sentinel. Sentinel, 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 Sentinel. I told you I was really excited about this, right? So the new Vault policy model. So it's a multi-tiered defense in-depth approach to access control. We like defense in depth of vault. That's you know, one of the things that we, we do. We espouse it. We tell everyone to do it. So we have ACLs. We still have them. They're the normal kind of coarse-grained ACLs that you know and love. Um, uh, those aren't going anywhere. We have role governing policies. So these are sentinel policies that are attached to tokens and identity information. And then we have endpoint governing policies. So these are policies that are sentinel that are attached to prefixes within vault, um, including most unauthenticated paths. This means you can start having, uh, uh, start talking about and, and describing in these in these policies things that you want to do on paths that aren't even you know being hit up with a token. So it looks kind of like this. Um, so we have things that are request based. So these are the ACLs and the role governing policies. And then we have the endpoint based ones. And here, what this is showing, and I'll talk about this a bit more, is that you know you can have multiple different endpoint governing policies that all get evaluated in the context of a single request. Um, and if you have seen what Console is doing, um, Console is doing it initially, at least. They're doing inline Sentinel policies. And so why aren't we doing that? And it's because of path merging. Um, so actually, I have a quick question, because this is a, something that we debate often uh, within the Vault team. So who, who here uses Vault? OK. Keep your hands up. Put them, put them down if I tell you. OK. Put your hand down if you, uh, if you don't use path merging. So basically, sorry, I'm making this more complicated. <laughs> I originally was going to have them like three, and then somewhere along the way, I just forgot which was the sec like what the second question was going to be. So basically, just if you write vault policies and you merge paths together as you write vault policies, put your hand up. Let me see. OK. Yeah, that maps out to about what I expect. So we have this thing that we can't get rid of because people do use it. But at the same time, not many people use it, and it makes our lives much more complicated. Um, so one of the ways in which it makes it complicated is, um, is if we want to think about how would we merge Sentinel policies, what's the right thing to do? Is it to or the rules? Is it to and the rules? And whenever we try to think through, like, what would, you know, what about if a person wanted to do this in Sentinel? Like, how would you describe that in Apples in a way that would, like, merge the Sentinel policies together in the way that you always want? Um, so it's very uncertain. And when you're in security, you don't like uncertainty. Um, uh, you know, I think in some ways, Vault is, like, the least magical of the HashCorp products. And that's very much on purpose. So we don't do it like that. OK. So we have defense in depth. So basically, here's the, the policy flow now. So if the request is unauthenticated, we only do EGPs because we don't have a token, so you skip to step four. Step two, if ACLs are, comp uh, ACLs are compiled and evaluated as normal, you still have to have an ACL that grants you capabilities. So you have to be able to, to go through that sort of coarse grain check and say, yes, you are allowed to access this path with these capabilities. Um, and you know, if you do any sort of allowed and denied parameter stuff, that still takes effect. 
Um, and that's even, even if you just say, you know what, I only want to use Sentinel, then you still have to have a single ACL policy that has star and gives you know, every single capability to everybody. I don't recommend it, but you can do it. OK, step three. Uh, role governing policies attached to the token or identity information are evaluated. Um, any failure fails the request. So we use normal sentinel evaluation, uh, advisory, soft mandatory, hard mandatory. So if a soft mandatory or hard mandatory failed um, and overrides are not specified for soft, um, then it fails at that point. Once we've gotten to that point, we go to EGPs and we say, all right, uh, look at the prefix um, in vault. So, uh, you know, if it's secret slash foo and you have one at secret foo, secret, and star, as we saw before, um, then we actually look at each of those prefixes um, and each of those paths. So EGP is from uh, basically an exact match and any glob that's all the way up the tree all get evaluated. And so that's actually really nice because you can sort of layer how you're doing these things. You can say, you know what, I have this sort of global policy that I want to define. I'm going to put it at star. I want every single request to be beholden to this. Um, and then for, you know, under secret, uh, then I have kind of another set of policies, and then I'm going to give uh, you know some other like minor set of of extra restrictions on this you know one set of keys or two set of keys or something, um, and you just put those on at the various levels, and uh, and they all get evaluated. So unlike ACLs, as I just said, EGPs use this prefix walk. Um, so in this example, all EGPs at all three paths will be evaluated if uh, if it's secret slash foo. So we have the exact match, and then we have um, Going up the tree, it's, it's done internally as a radix tree. Going up the tree, um, anywhere, anything that's a glob uh, matches. Some paths don't and won't support HP. So as an example, generate root is already your path of last resort, right? Use generate root if like, you revoked all tokens in vault accidentally. You take a quorum of unsealed key holders uh, altogether, and you generate a root token, you can like, get back in business. Um, if you had EGPs on that that said you can never do this, uh, then that would be useless. So uh, generate root won't support it. Um, and speaking of which, just as you know, an FYI, uh, just like with ACLs, root tokens skip RGPs and EGPs. You should never be having live root tokens for anything other than exact things that you are doing right then. You should always have multiple eyes on root tokens. Um, and uh, in, when I give trainings and I talk about root tokens and kind of managing them, I always say, uh, Treat root tokens like they're the ninja in a movie where like the baddies are surrounding the ninja and do all the things that the baddies don't do. So like, you know, the baddies will like go away and leave the token alone or the ninja alone and they'll have one person there that's easily overcome, right? You just have multiple eyes on it, revoke it as soon as possible, et cetera. So while it's going, Vault will inject properties of the request and or user into Sentinel in various namespaces. So right now, what exists are request. Um, so that's information about the request itself. What is the path? What is the operation type? Is it an update? Is it a read? Um, what, are the what is the raw data that was, uh, that was brought in? Um, other information about it. Was a policy override requested? Um, is it unauthenticated? And so on. Uh, we have tokens. So that's information about the token being used, creation time, what policies are attached, um, what's the current TTL, things like that. Uh, identity. So this is identity, entities, and related data. Um, and MFA, so access to information about MFA validations. And we're going to go talk about those things um, a little bit more. And if you're doing an unauthenticated uh, uh, item, you obviously won't have token, right? It just, there won't be anything there because we don't have a token attached to the request. Um, so some of those things are only valid for RGPs, and some of them will be in both RGPs and EGPs. OK, so enough yammering about like all this stuff. Let's show it to you. So these are all real. Excuse me. These are all real Sentinel policies that work, that do things. So this is an example. This is a very, very basic example of allowing only specific entities or groups. So this is using Vault's identity system, which debuted in 08 in Enterprise and is coming to open source in 09. Um, so this is showing an example of you know, uh, if an identity entity name is Jeff, or my ID is whatever, or, um, or one of the groups that I'm in is sysops or that ID, uh, then I'm allowed. Right? That passes. Um, we do recommend if you're, um, whenever you're using like a name versus ID, use ID when possible. Um, ID does not change, um, it's not reused, whereas name, someone can delete an entity out, create a new entity with the same name, and your policy will still match. So always use IDs when you're, uh, if, if you think that might be uh, possible. All right, this is a nicer example. So this is multi factor authentication and CIDR check on login. So I'm going to start at the bottom. Um, 
So let's start at the bottom, this thing here, when request path. So it's main equals rule when request path is auth ldap login. So send on policies must pass, right? But it creates an issue because vault lives in this default deny world. Like, that's what we've always done. That's what we like. So how do you ensure policies pass if, without saying true and defining restrictions, right? Because at a base level, you have to say true, and then you just restrict what's there. Um, so we have this precondition mechanism. And that describes the conditions under which the rules should be evaluated. So it defaults to always. So if there's no precondition, then it will get evaluated. And then describes success uh, criteria. So it's actually not that different from Ackles, right? Ackles, you give a path. That's your precondition. Um, and then you talk about the, cap the capabilities you should get on that path. In Sentinel, it can actually be an arbitrarily complex statement. So um, you'll see examples later where that precondition is actually another rule. And the evaluation of, the, of that rule, true or false, uh, says whether or not the precondition is evaluated. And what if no preconditions match? Um, it's still default deny uh, because you all have had to have been granted capabilities on the path via ACLs. So like, if no Sentinel policies match at all, um, you still have to have that coarse-grained ACL permission. Let's go back to this. So um, the next part I want to highlight is this auth LDAP login. So this is an endpoint governing policy on a login path. So full-featured request-based access control. Um, and it's a little bit contrived. Normally, you'd put the EGP at the endpoint itself. Um, this is just for this example. I wanted to show something here. Um, normally, you'd say, like, I'm going to just put it on, on that path instead of evaluating it everywhere, uh, just for performance reasons. OK, so the next bit is this. So on that bottom rule, you can see ping valid and CIDR check. So I'm looking at the ping valid rule now. You can see mfa.methods.ping.valid. So the identity-based MFA system that we debuted didn't support login paths. Now you know why. It was waiting on Sentinel. Um, it was waiting for us to get this capability to do these endpoint-based paths. Uh, sorry, endpoint-based policies. Um, so now that we have that, we can do some really cool things with it. So in many cases, we get no, pre uh, no preconfiguration is necessary for users. And the reason is that what we've done is we built this mechanism where we go to an auth backend and we say, all right, if given this request data, if this was successful, what would the, what would the um, uh, unique username be? And then we take that back, and we go to the MFA check, and we say, we don't have access to anything outside of just this name. But in many cases, that name will match to some name that's also in your MFA provider. So it'll be, you know, it might be that name at uh, example.com, right? And so in many cases, you don't even need to pre-configure. You just configure the MFA method. You put a Sentinel policy on the path, and you can get automatic MFA for logins without any other pre-configuration. Um, for those that require uh, any sort of like massaging of that or using metadata from identity to do that, um, then that's still possible too. You just have to go in and hit up some endpoints and like pre-configure those identities. Um, MFA runs for login. So the reason that's nice is if MFA fails, we don't need to revoke or clean up uh, anything. We don't have to revoke a token. We don't have to potentially hit up a third-party API to like do anything there. Um, and it's harder to brute force, right? You can't get to the point where you're trying to like, brute force a password if you are failing the MFA check in the first place. So we do MFA before login. So this is the, the whole thing together. Um, so you can see we're, we're doing this check, MFA methods.ping.valid. Simply running that check right there actually triggers the validation. And we memoize the results. So if you have multiple, um, multiple policies that are doing a check on ping, and ping there, by the way, is just the name of the method. It is one of the, ping identity is one of the supported uh, MFA methods, but there is just the name. So basically, uh, when that's checked, we memoize it. And so any other time during that request, if we get a uh, validation check for that MFA method, then we actually just use that. Um, we use that result. And that also applies. You can, you can trigger MFA checks from ACLs, and those are shared between the ACLs and, um, and Sentinel policies. Um, and the last thing there that, that I didn't get to before is just that we also can have this CIDR check. So there's a SOC adder as one of the standard imports. And we can say if the remote address is within you know, it must be within this uh, private IP range. If we say, look, nobody should be trying to log into Vault if they're not coming from our corporate network. OK. So the next thing I want to talk about is a break glass case. So suppose that you just found out that a bunch of tokens have leaked out. You don't know which ones um, have been compromised. You don't know where they might have gone. You don't know what they might have been used for. Um, but you want to make sure that they can't be used right now and give yourself some time to, to uh, perform forensics. So with the existing system, you can say, you know what, I'm going to deny all requests except root. So I can just do like star and just deny all. Um, and you can revoke all tokens. Two problems. One is that if you're denying all requests, then 
it means that nobody else can actually like get a new non-compromised token and actually do things while that policy is in effect. If that's applying to all uh, to all all, all of your tokens, um, you can also revoke all tokens. But if you find out that there was actually only just one token that leaked, and you could revoke that one token, now you have a whole bunch of tokens that you've revoked that are no longer valid that might actually have like leases attached to them that you want to keep. Um, and it can take a while. Like when you revoke a token, it revokes all associated leases. And so all of those leases have to, you know, potentially go up to like third party databases or third party providers and say, you know, destroy this user, destroy this user, destroy this user. So that can take a while if you're, if you're doing, you know, hundreds or thousands of tokens. So Sentinel provides a different way forward. And it's really simple, really nice. So the following would be an HTTP that you would just set on star. Really, really simple. So the rule says, when the request is not unauthenticated, the token creation time has to be after that point in time at which you discover the compromise. Really simple. Um, some of the syntax there, there are a couple of features coming in Sentinel that will make that a little bit easier. But right now, this is literally just saying, in, in the time package, when you do a load, it creates what's, what we call a time space. And then we're getting the Unix value and checking that against the Unix value of um, that fixed string. And because of that request that unauthenticated, then uh, it means that somebody else that's coming in and saying, you know what, we want to block all these previous tokens because we don't know if they've been disclosed. Um, someone can come in, authenticate fresh with their credentials, get a new vault token, and it's not going to be subject to these restri uh, restrictions. So you've denied all previously existing tokens while still allowing people to get new tokens and continue on with their day. <laughs> um, OK. So my final example here is delegating EGP policy management. So we get asked about this all the time. You know, we want to delegate policies, right? We need to delegate policies. Um, and the main reason that it hasn't appeared before now is because it's really, really hard to figure out how to do that with the ACL specification that we have. Um, it's pretty much possible. Like any, any sort of flexibility and expressivity that you might want in terms of you know, the things that that, uh, that that policy is allowed to define um, the paths that it's allowed to access are things that would either have to be worked into like totally new APIs um, that take like totally different sets of parameters just to like write the same kind of policy, or um, or have like incredibly complex uh, uh, syntax and structures. Um, just really super difficult to express with JSON and HDL. Um, so this policy is longer. I'm going to show it in two parts. Talk through it. So this first part is using the preconditions to narrow the scope to just policy writing. So we're saying, um, uh, you know, we don't even want to check this if it's not on a path where policies are being written. Um, so in this case, it's not necessarily a contrivance. You could do this as an EGP that you say, I want to set it on, um, on this path. But you could also set it on tokens. So if you want to say, like, this is actually an RGP, and I'm just going to put on the tokens of the people that are, uh, that are authorized to do this, then you can set it there. And the advantage of doing it that way is you're not forcing every request to run through uh, the Sentinel check, you're only forcing it to run through when, um, when it's these uh, particular people that you want to delegate to. All right. So this first part starts up with main. And you can see here that the precondition is a rule itself. So all that has to happen is the precondition just has to turn into a Boolean, true or false. Um, so we look at the request operation, see if it's create or update. And then we look for a prefix uh, of request path of syspolicies EGP. So when that matches, so when someone's trying to write an EGP, then the next, that matches. So the next thing we do is we look for a prefix on the request path of syspolicies EGP team A. So here in the example, this is team A that I want to give uh, access to. And I want to say, you can write any policy that you want as long as it starts with team A dash so that, so that I know who did it. Um, before I continue on, uh, actually, can you go back one slide? So I'm, I'm not sure, don't remember if I talk about this later, but um, this is using a bunch of uh, has prefix, like strings that has prefix. And there's a strings package, and it has like contains, and it has some other things. Um, S Sentinel has matches as an operator. And matches is cool. Um, it's a regex. If you're in security, you don't like regexes. Um, they're very easy to get wrong. Regex engines have, um, have been the source of much pain uh, security-wise over time. Um, they can be very hard to reason about when they get very big. So when all you need to do is something simple, then say, like, here's an explicit, I want to check for prefix. I don't want to just do like a regex that, uh, that I think does what I think it does, and maybe it doesn't. Um, OK. So the second part is a function that verifies the path set. So 
So this is a little, little bit longer, so I'll go through it. So the first part there is saying, I'm going to check that there is request data. I'm going to check that the request data has a key named paths, because in the uh, in uh, SysPolicy CGP, then paths is where you set the paths that it should apply to. So I'm going to check that paths is actually populated. Um, if not, return false. And for each path, verify that it's in the allowed list. So we're splitting the request paths. Um, we accept both uh, comma separated values and um, JSON uh, arrays. So basically, depending on if you're doing it on the command line or over the API, you can do both. So first, we make sure that it's split so we can loop through. And then we sanitize it and say, get rid of any leading uh, slash. And then we just do this little basic thing that says, OK, if, uh, if it doesn't have this prefix, dev kv, or it doesn't have that prefix, uh, prod kv team a, it's this lab. So what we've done here is we've said, and by the way, this you know, a little bit of a contrived example too. It does work, but of course, don't run dev and prod on the same server. Just, just check in and run. All right. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we had a, let's see. Like I said, we had a, there was a customer that um, did run dev, QA, and prod on the same server and ran into problems. And I can't say more than that, but they ran into big problems um, when something in dev went haywire. Uh, so don't do that. Anyways, uh, so here we're saying, OK, for every path that comes in, the path that that EGP is applying to has to be one of those, has to start with one of those two things. So you can imagine here's a dev KV. Here's prod KV to two mounts of the KV backend, which is what we've renamed generic to. Um, and then within those two things, they can delegate policy under team A. So at that point, anyone on team A that you give this policy to can go in and say, you know what, I want to control, uh, you know, I'm being put in charge of dev KV team A slash, uh, you know, sysops. And, Dev KV team A slash devs. In fact, there's really no reason why the person in charge of Dev KV team A can't then write an EGP that applies one level down, so that other people then have, you know, based on like say identity group information, can then uh, carve it out even further down along the way. Um, so this is really nice. This is something people have been asking for for a long time, and it's just waiting for us to get to a point where we have this nice expressivity um, in policy language to do this. Um, so I think I just talked through all that <laughs> anyways, but uh, so trying to do, so this was talking about strings that has prefix, but doing this in, in JSON, we ran into this doing, doing um, allowed, al sorry, allowed parameters to nine parameters, where we were trying to think like, okay, within allowed parameters and nine parameters, if we don't want to allow regexes, do we allow globs? Do we allow them at the end, at the beginning? What happens if someone wants a literal glob? Do we do like two globs together? Is literal glob? And it, it became a very sad thing to try to reason about. Um, and it's, it's quite difficult. So uh, you know, regexes can work, but often not desirable for the reasons I, uh, I laid out. Um, so uh, so you know, we have this, this nice package that does it. And those packages are going to grow over time. Um, so that's the whole thing again, this, this uh, data match function. All right. So last thing here, um, Ackles, Sentinel, or both. So Sentinel is slower than Ackles, um, milliseconds, not microseconds. Um, the Vault team, we were sort of surprised to hear that, that uh, one of these people that were uh, uh, organiz organizations using it were saying that they have these really tight timing requirements for Vault requests. And, and Vault was meeting them, but they wanted to like, do some, some really fancy stuff, and they were concerned that Vault might not be able to meet it. And we said, you know, what are your timing requirements? Thinking it'd be like order of milliseconds. And they said, oh, well, I mean, right now it's handling things at you know, about 20 microseconds. We're like, wait, what? Um, <laughs> so we didn't actually know that it could do that. Um, but Sentinel, we do know, is slower. I mean, it's a, it's a whole language. It has to do a lot of um, interpolation of the various kinds of parameters, the various kinds of data, um, especially when you, you know, considering that you can call in from there and then call into other functions in Vault. Um, so it's slower. So if you need super, super fast time critical operations, you should stick to ACLs. Um, in most cases in Vault, this won't be important. Um, but at the same time, if you're doing time critical operations in Vault, it's, it's really only one concern. So, um, you know, identity lookups is slow. Identity is super useful, but if you're doing like super high, th high, high throughput transit stuff, um, encryption as a service, you don't really need it um, and probably should not use it. Um, Sentinel, you know, benchmark it for your use case. As always, it's, you know, it depends on what you're trying to do, um, how much time, uh, what your time requirements are. And then the final thing is use as few ACL statements as possible. Um, even if you're just limiting to ACLs, as I said before, you know, it has to merge things together. It has to build up this ACL object. So the more paths you have, the more things it has to build into this, into this object and then evaluate against. Um, so you know, generally speaking, time critical operations, the, the, more simple thing, uh, the more simple you can keep it, the better. Um, but if you don't have super tight timing, Sentinel's super, super, super nice. 
Um, so that's it. Um, I'll be around for questions. Um, like I said before, uh, I've been lead on Vault for a little over two years now, um, since just after 0 0.2. Um, this is certainly the top three most exciting things that I've ever like, worked on in Vault, for sure. Um, it might be number one. I'm just so thrilled about this um, and the ways that we can uh, describe policies now and things, uh, things we can do with it. So um, hope everyone enjoys it. Thank you.